Desjardins and Maruti, uh, were involved in trying to say, how are we going to meet this, uh, this mandate? And what they didn't want to do was to put into place something that uh, basically did nothing uh, but met the mandate. So a number of places, uh, as, as some of us are aware, have met this mandate, or this, the, the upcoming mandate at this time now since has become a mandate, uh, the mandate to do suicide uh, risk screening, have met it by basically just asking a pro forma question um, in the last month, have you thought about uh, suicide? or something like that when people check in. In the same way uh, that, that someone would ask about what, how much pain are you in, or they'd ask about um, you know, whether you feel safe in the house. So, um, so that uh, is uh, you know, meeting the mandate, but in fact, there's no real evidence that that type of screening uh, affects whether or not people are going to die by suicide. So they uh, specifically were interested in trying to, to find out if we could create something where, uh, that would predict whether, whether folks would, uh, would go on to have uh, a, su a suicide attempt, at least. Uh, and there were a number of events that came out from the Joint Commission, you can see starting back in 1998 and up to 2010, but really it was the one um, that came out, uh, this, this um, more recent one, 2016, that, um, that sort of pushed people uh, towards doing this more systematically. And that was looking at the events that happen in hospitals uh, and comparing things like uh, uh, unintended foreign bodies or wrong patient surgeries and then comparing that to um, either uh, the self-inflicted injury uh, or uh, suicide within the hospital setting and realizing that the rates for self-inflicted injury and suicide were about the same as wrong, wrong side surgery. Um, so there is a significant problem for hospitals um, and we have lots of things in place to prevent falls, for example, or to prevent same uh, wrong side surgeries, but very little were, was in place uh, to prevent suicide or self-inflicted injury. So when they went back, when the commission went back to see what was the main problem, the main problem was that most people were failing assessment. So they, they weren't actually uh, doing any type of, uh, of assessment, uh, and that was leading to uh, the, the root causes of these, uh, these self-inflicted injuries uh, and uh, suicide in the hospital setting. So they put out a uh, Sentinel alert in 2016 um, that basically they wanted hospitals and healthcare settings to be uh, detecting and treating suicidal ideation in, in all settings uh, with a statement that many people who, uh, who died by suicide were receiving healthcare services in the year uh, prior to, uh, to their death, um, but usually for reasons unrelated to suicide. So could you detect within the general uh, medical population some signal that would suggest that people were likely to die by suicide within the next year. And then they put out a national safety goal that requested or basically suggested um, and eventually required that uh, there's a conduct uh, a conduct of a suicide risk assessment identifying characteristics um, and environmental uh, features that may increase the risk for suicide. So this was the mandate. Uh, the question was how are you going to meet that mandate in a way that actually does what it's supposed to do. In, in the time since 2016, more information has come out uh, with regard to how common and frequent are uh, suicides in inpatient hospitals. Uh, and the most widely cited figure, including a figure that was uh, really uh, went out in the 2003 APA guidelines, um, was that there were 1,500 uh, deaths by suicide on inpatient, in inpatient settings. A reanalysis of those data um, and, and actually, uh, well, actually a reanalysis of the publication of this number uh, basically uh, got to the point where they realized this was sort of a, a number that was kind of made up. It was a number that was based on percentage of people who come in to a hospital with specific chief complaints and the likelihood that they would uh, end up uh, dying by suicide in the hospital. So when they went to reanalyze the actual data from the National Violent Death Reporting System, what they found is that there, there still are a significant number of uh, deaths by suicide in, uh, in inpatient settings, but they're not quite as many as they initially thought. Um, and this has led some organizations to say, well, maybe we shouldn't be screening quite as, quite as hard, um, which doesn't really make doesn't really make a lot of sense. Just because there's a few fewer of them doesn't mean that the ones uh, aren't, aren't important. So the, the basic problem then that was set before us was that the Joint Commission requires screening in all settings and then following that assessment. So they'd really divide this up by a screen and then an assessment. 
And um, also the problem is that the majority of those inpatient suicides, at least in the most recent analysis, occurred in psychiatric settings. But that's not measuring what happens when people leave the hospital. So where we ended up focusing most of our efforts was on the, the emergency department, because that was the sort of funnel in, both to the inpatient setting, but also to people as they leave the hospital. Because the real concern, the, the numbers that I was talking about about inpatient suicide don't track sentinel events, which are other uh, things like death by suicide within 72 hours after leaving the hospital. Um, so uh, we basically wanted to uh, develop a screening tool that would allow us to detect it both once people went into the hospital, but also as they left. Um, and uh, based on basically when sentinel events are recorded, and also based on this idea that when we're seeing somebody in the emergency department, the decision that we're making is really whether we're going to hold them for the next 72 hours, um, at least within the state of Vermont um, and in, in several other states, we determined that we really wanted to be concentrating on that near-term risk, whether somebody's likely to die within the next 72 hours, which is not something that has really been uh, focused upon in the, in the general literature. So I, I mentioned that there are screening tools and there are uh, then further assessment tools. That, so here are some of the, uh, the main uh, sort of screening tools that are out there and the way that people are approaching this. Um, so uh, oftentimes what people will do is they'll give something like a PHQ-2, which measures a couple of questions, hence the name, PHQ-2, um, versus the PHQ-9, which you guessed it, measures nine. Um, and it, it, in there is a question that has to do with uh, depression. And if somebody screens positive on that PHQ-2 or PHQ-9 question, then they might get a, a more uh, thorough assessment. The same kinds of things are in the ED safe, which has the PHQ-2. And then portions of a, an instrument that I'll mention in, uh, in probably excruciating detail uh, to you, uh, the Columbia suicide um, uh, severity uh, uh, device. And so that's the CSSRS. Um, and so it has these portions of the PHQ-2 and then the CSSRS. Um, and what the, uh, the ED safe can do is basically it can have, it can give you some idea of someone's lifetime risk for suicide, um, which if we're trying to concentrate on what happens in the next 72 hours uh, is helpful, but probably not uh, as helpful as you want it to be. Um, and then the SBQ uh, and the ASQ, which do uh, the same sorts of things, they, they can in a population tell you whether uh, one group is more likely to be suicidal than the next, but have less predictive validity within the particular individual. These tend to be followed by secondary screening instruments, the most common of which is the Columbia uh, Suicide uh, Severity Rating Scale. Um, and uh, these others incorporate bits and pieces of that. What they typically do is they talk about protective factors and risk factors. They then give you some information about that and help you sort of weigh that um, in your risk assessment. Uh, so that's uh, that is the, the usefulness of these tools uh, for the most part. But the question is, uh, do they actually do what we think that, that they are supposed to do? So um, here's the, the um, Suicide Prevention Resource uh, Center. Uh, are suicide screening and assessments effective? I'm not going to you know, wait for everybody to read this. I'll just let you know that they uh, basically surveyed uh, the VA, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, the uh, AAP, which is uh, pediatrics, and the APA, which is psychi psychiatry. And basically, none of them said that any of these uh, assessments are really doing what we want them to do. Um, every, every one of them basically says there's limited evidence that these things will, will help you in the short term. So why don't they do this? Why don't they seem to work? Well, part of it is that most of them really accumulate, as I said, these sort of risk and protective factors and then lay it on you as the clinician to sort of make a determination. Um, and uh, there seems to be limited, ev limited evidence that uh, both this approach, but also this idea that you have enough protective factors to protect you against the suicide risk, those data are also starting to be questioned. Whether uh, you can actually have enough protective factors um, is, a, uh, is a, an article that just came out uh, in the last year sort of talking about like, whether, how much protection is enough, and we don't know. And there's a need then to predict specific near-term imminent, um, what, what's the most recent one? The, 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 everybody's coming up with a new phrase for this. We used to call it immediate risk or near-term risk or uh, imminent risk, but uh, there, there's, there's more and more of these terms. But the, the idea is, can you predict something quickly? Uh, it, not whether somebody is going to die by suicide over their lifetime. We also felt uh, that there was a need to use uh, accumulated risk factor information, um, but 
to allow for that, uh, that opinion that experts have in making a determination. So could we develop a screening tool that took that piece out of it as well? So in addition to weighing those risk and protective factors, could we also model somebody's decision making so that we could give you a more accurate assessment? So as I mentioned, the, this, this group got together. Um, uh, unfortunately, I didn't wear my jacket that day, um, something I've been uh, you know, beat up on um, multiple times. Uh, but uh, really, it was the, um, the, the, f the foundation, the Fletcher Allen Foundation at the time, and then the UVM uh, Foundation after, um, which uh, really initially funded this, uh, this work. And so uh, we, we put together this, uh, this initial study. And the initial study was really to uh, get a group of experts together, and uh, experts in suicide, assuming that none of us were, and uh, we would bring them together and start to try to model their thought processes. And so the first thing we did was go out and ask a whole bunch of experts if they'd be willing to come to Vermont for a couple of days to have this discussion. Um, and uh, so this panel of national experts uh, was our, our very first uh, piece of this. And so we put out a whole bunch of emails, and uh, to Isabel's surprise, people said yes. Um, so this was the group of panelists, um, many of whom are some of, of the, uh, the leading experts in suicide uh, risk prediction. So uh, basically people who have served on national task forces, people who have written the book on suicide risk prediction, uh, people who have uh, chaired committees on, uh, at, the, at the APA or at the DSM. And so all, all these folks came to town, and then we had to figure out what to do with them. Um, so what we did was uh, we did a comprehensive literature review that we presented to them. We then had a discussion with them of uh, what were the important pieces within that literature review. And then we gave them, presented them with a bunch of cases. And what really happened was um, we had this conversation about risk factors one night, and then the next, then that night, Sanchez stayed up all night changing these cases around to make them about those uh, particular those particular things that they thought were important. We presented them with those, uh, with those cases. We had them rate the cases, on, which were systematically varied by different, on different components. And then we had a discussion. And this is where uh, we used the, the ability from, of Willie Katzbrill and this nominal group technique, which he uh, has perfected, to try to um, basically tune and tweak a model to the point where we got to one, a model that everyone would say, yeah, that's pretty close. Um, and uh, this was the model uh, that at least we came up with coming out of that initial, initial uh, phase zero uh, part of the study. Um, you can see the questions here. Um, there's only a few of them. So how much pain are you in? Um, without any caveats, not, not asking about emotional pain, physical pain, uh, uh, what it, whatever. How are you coping? Again, without any caveats, just asking about coping. How upset are you? How would you rate your wish to live and your wish to die? Uh, have you been considering suicide in the last month? Have you had recent losses? Um, have you recently been using substances? Have you ever attempted suicide? Have you been diagnosed with one of these major uh, uh, these uh, mental illnesses that we know are associated with suicide? And have you ever been uh, in the psychiatric hospital? We combined those uh, with that basic demographic information about age, uh, sex, and whether somebody was presenting with a, a psychiatric chief complaint and built this into a tool that we then uh, used in the emergency setting. So this is what we thought the model uh, would basically be. We thought it would be some combination of these, uh, of these uh, items based on that initial study. So then we decided to test it. And uh, what we needed to do initially was we wanted to see if, whether it would actually predict. Because what we did is we were trying to predict near-term risk for suicide based on what the experts would say. right? So what we really wanted to do was give somebody, hand, hand you a tool that you could say, if an expert were here, this is what they say somebody's risk would be uh, in, in the next 72 hours. So we trained up a, a set of psychiatrists uh, in the emergency department, and uh, we tested the, uh, the platform uh, based, on, uh, based on what they would have to say. So this was that initial study. Um, we uh, screened a, a batch of uh, 800 folks coming through the emergency department. We ended up with 271 uh, agreeing to participate and 270 completed. Um, we ended up with a few with incomplete data by the time we were done, uh, but we ended up uh, with 122 in each uh, branch uh, of, the, uh, of the arm. This sequence really is um, whether we did the tablet first or the, or the uh, expert interview first, um, which turned out to not make uh, really any difference at all. 
Um, so we ended up with uh, you know 250 some odd folks uh, in that initial study, uh, and then we thought we were just going to be able to use the algorithm that uh, we had developed with the experts in order to uh, to predict whether somebody was at low, uh, um, um, moderate, or high risk. We initially gave the experts this scale, um, sort of high risk for suicide, so suicide possible and likely, again, within the next 72 hours. So this is not somebody's overall risk in their lifetime, which is something that it took us a while to sort of train the experts out of. Um, so our psychiatrists, when we, uh, both, both in the overall panel, but also the psychiatrists in the ED, we had to work with them really on what we're talking about in the next 72 hours. This is not about uh, whether somebody is at overall risk, because we know we, know we have tools that can predict that. So uh, are they at high, moturate, low, and then we had a minimal risk category. We turn, we, it turned out that everybody had a hard time discriminating between what low and minimal meant, um, so we ended up combining these in the eventual analysis. We also asked them to give us some idea about what intervention they would do, uh, so we gave them some you know, routine intervention, so everybody gets some, some education, a specialized, so they would, they would get a crisis consultation, a highly specialized, which means we would move them to an a, a environment that was, uh, harm, that was uh, free of, of harmful hazards, um, and then a secured uh, setting where we would have them on uh, constant observation. So we wanted to see if these two things separated, whether risk and an intervention were separate from one another or whether, uh, whether they, were, they ran right along with each other. So we initial, uh, the initial plan was to put these things into basically an additive model. Uh, we would put them into uh, basically just a regression and see, see what would happen and see if we could predict whether uh, from the, the instrument, from this iPad-based sort of tool that people did in the self-report, um, whether we could predict what the experts would say. Um, and that initial regression worked fine, um, but uh, in, while we were talking about it and we were discussing other analytic methods, uh, we decided in the end to see whether a neural network algorithm would work better. So the thought was that basically maybe this isn't just a linear combination of variables. Um, maybe when an expert is deciding whether somebody is at near-term risk for suicide, they uh, are weighing things in a nonlinear fashion uh, based on the prior probabilities and their own experience. So we ended up putting it into this neural network model. I know you won't be able to read this, um, but basically these are uh, the different variables all going into a hidden layer. This is basically um, in your head. This is where your uh, interneurons are working. So it's basically taking the information in, doing some computation, and sending out an output into our three levels of risk. Um, and we did this. We basically uh, built the model on half the data. We did a tuning uh, phase on data that had been held out, and then we tested it on a, another set of data that had been held out. Uh, so the idea here is that we, in the end, our true test was on a set of data that, that had never uh, been, been, uh, been modeled before. And this is what that initial uh, uh, results looked like. This is our training set. We classified at about 95% uh, of the time what the expert was, would say just on the basis of that uh, iPad-based uh, uh, small tool. Um, this is our testing set, so that our, that's our tuning and tweaking set. But this is the holdout set. Um, that's the one that really, in the end, mattered. Uh, and we were classifying at about 95% what the expert would say, uh, at least for risk. Um, so this was high enough that we, didn't, that, that we questioned whether or not it was real. Um, and so uh, much to everyone's chagrin, we went back and redid the study um, to, and started over with a new data set uh, to, to make sure that it would work. Um, so we replicated and then extended uh, to the med surge population um, and to inpatient psychiatry to see whether the same model would work for these, for these settings. So now we have a model built off that initial data set and we're testing it in a replication sample. Um, and uh, what I'm showing you here uh, are the, uh, the predictions from the uh, emergency department. Um, so uh, again, we're basically classifying uh, relatively, relatively well, again, in the sort of 90 percentile uh, range for whether somebody is at high risk or low risk. The places where we end up having a harder time is the moderate, um, but we're rarely classifying anybody as low, at low risk as high or anybody who's uh, at low risk as high or anybody who's at high risk as being low based on uh, the psychiatrist assessment. And the same thing was true in uh, med surge. Um, we, we did that uh, relatively uh, rarely. Uh, but of course, the med surge population had the lower base rates of, of suicidal ideation. This is showing you the intervention. We did about as well with the intervention. Um, here we did have four different, uh, four different uh, uh, 
categories that people could use, um, but we were, we were doing pretty well for intervention as well. Where we didn't do so well was inpatient psychiatry. Um, and in part, that's because of the question that we were asking the experts. We were asking the experts, within the next 72 hours, do you think this person is at risk uh, for death by suicide? Um, and because they were all on the inpatient psychiatry, um, I think they were making a, a reasoned assumption that we'd be able to uh, generally keep people safe. Um, so uh, we actually didn't do as well uh, with, with this because uh, a, lot of our, uh, a lot of our folks uh, were being rated as relatively, uh, relatively low when the model was rating them as higher. And uh, this is our, our intervention piece within inpatient psychiatry. We did uh, really poorly there because almost everybody was already in a highly specialized or secure setting. Um, so it, it really sort of didn't work, but I, I thought I'd show it to you anyway. Um, remember, I was at, I, we were asking the experts to do just a, a, a determination of whether somebody was at near-term risk. Um, so we weren't asking them to do a full psychiatric assessment. We were really asking them to do a targeted assessment because we wanted to get an estimate for how long this would take um, if you were just going in to do a targeted assessment. It took about eight, uh, eight minutes uh, for the experts in general to do that assessment. Remember, this uh, is going to encompass both folks who are at, at low, mostly folks who are at low uh, or minimal risk. Um, it took our, the, the tool about, uh, about a minute. Um, so most folks did this uh, relatively quickly. So uh, from that initial uh, phase, uh, we d determined that at least we were able to replicate what the experts would be thinking in the ER. Um, and we thought we could do it relatively rapidly with, uh, with uh, self-report, uh, and we thought it might be useful. So at that point uh, was really the phase at which we said, okay, well, maybe this is useful to, to try to get it, uh, to get it out there. Uh, and uh, we uh, both uh, developed this uh, this wiser systems approach where we uh, got ourselves incorporated so that we could apply for SBIR funding. Um, but we also partnered with a company that's now called VOI, at the time it was called First Opinion, um, who put it onto a, a platform that could then be taken out and, and we could tr start to try to pilot it as if we were going to, uh, to put it into the hands of uh, of somebody who, who wanted to, uh, to use it in their healthcare system. Uh, so that partnership, um, actually most of, uh, most of the work that we did was with uh, this group, Incente, that was acquired by First Opinion. Incente is uh, Bill Hudenko, who works down at, uh, at Dartmouth, um, is a, a professor down there, uh, but also has this, uh, has this software uh, company. We realized at that time that the majority of the work that we were going to do um, in comparison was going to have to be with, uh, uh, compared to the Columbia. So the Columbia uh, uh, Suicide Severity Rating Scale uh, is really the gold standard out there for, uh, for prediction of uh, risk within, within healthcare settings um, and a number of other settings. And you can see there, um, this is just from their website, they're endorsed by a whole bunch of different things, including the FDA, the Columbia is, is most commonly used in the, in the FDA trials. Um, the Columbia comes in a number of different forms. By far the most uh, well studied is this full form of the, uh, the CSSRS. So it has a, a research literature, it has a implementation literature. Um, this takes a little while. You have to be trained uh, to do it. And what it really does is it gives you, again, these sort of risk and protective factors uh, and uh, gives you really nice characterization of, of suicidal ideation and intent when somebody, and plan when somebody has it. Um, so that's the, the, the big form. The short form, uh, the shorter form, there's a whole series of uh, versions of this, but this is the one that's most commonly used in healthcare settings. So in the emergency department, almost always, what we're calling the EDCSSRS is the one that's used. And basically what you see is on the basis of a few questions, similar to uh, the CRS instrument, um, on the basis of a few questions, you rate somebody as being low, uh, moderate, or, or high risk. So uh, we ended up in the study that we proposed and eventually uh, got funded with SBIR funding to uh, test the Sears tool against both of these tools. So this is the phase that just uh, was just completed. Uh, we aimed for 480 participants. We ended up with 479 uh, in the uh, UVM um, Medical Center Emergency Department. Um, the, the patients uh, were were really fantastic to do this because what they had to do is a uh, serious assessment, a Columbia, uh, an in-person uh, uh, interview. Um, then they had to do some of those again 
So we, we repeated it because we were also looking at uh, test, uh, retest uh, validity um, or reliability. And then we followed them up after discharge, three to seven days, to see whether within the near term they were expressing suicidal thoughts or behaviors. Um, so uh, they, they really did. They were, they were awfully good sports because, remember, most of these folks were not coming in for a psychiatric chief complaint. This was a, a broad screening tool so you could come in for your sprained ankle and, 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 uh, and agree to participate in the study. We had uh, some dropout then of folks who uh, participated, who completed the study. About 80% of those completed the study. Some of them were discharged before we could get all that done. Um, some of them, uh, at, by the time we'd done two or three of these things, said we didn't want to do it. They didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and then about half of them we were able to get and follow up. This shows you how many had to be screened in order to do that. So 3,400 screened. Uh, 480 uh, were uh, enrolled, 479 enrolled, um, and then we ended up with 377 in the final study. And this gives you an idea of the demographic of that uh, second study then. Uh, about half of them female, uh, about uh, 45 years of age, which was close to our original uh, study. Um, most of them white. Uh, this was done in Vermont. Um, and you see the percentage that we got for folks who completed the follow-up. And this just gives you an idea of the completion of the, of the instruments that we did. The uh, repeats that we did of the Columbia and the ED screen, um, we ended up really comparing the repeat of the ED screen to the Columbia that we initially did. Because we didn't, re we didn't do a lot of repeats of the full Columbia. It was the part that patients really complained that they had to go through twice uh, because it was a, a pretty long assessment. And they, so we ended up replacing our repeat of the Columbia with a repeat of the shorter screen. So um, this is just showing you what we found. So we're basing this basically on uh, Cohen's Kappa, so levels of agreement. Uh, we found that they, uh, the Cirrus tool and the full Columbia, so the one that takes about uh, 15 to 20 minutes to complete, uh, were equivalent in their agreement uh, with the expert risk assessment. Uh, so they basically looked about the same. But the ED screener, the one that's most commonly used, the ED screener actually didn't relate at all to what the expert said. Um, so basically there was no difference uh, with the ED screener, there was no difference from zero um, in terms of what a psychiatrist would say in the emergency department. In the same way, when we looked at follow-up, we actually did uh, a little bit better in follow-up than we did in, uh, concurrently. So in follow-up, our, our agreements were actually in the, in the uh, really pretty, pretty decent range uh, for both Cirrus and the full Columbia. Uh, but for the ED screener, it really, the, the follow-up agreement was, was zero. Uh, it basically didn't predict, it didn't predict anything. And uh, in terms of our test retest reliability, um, just looking at experiment correlation, Cirrus, um, a pretty good test retest reliability. The ED screener actually didn't, didn't predict what happened on the actual Columbia. So the full Columbia wasn't predicted by the ED screener. So in the end, what our conclusion was with regard to that is that ED screener, the short form, the one that everybody's using, doesn't seem to be predicting what the long form does and doesn't seem to be predicting follow-up very well at all. Um, which, is a, which is a concern, because that's uh, the one most commonly in places in emergency departments across the country. We did a little bit on patient satisfaction, just to ask how, what people thought of it. Uh, I won't go into great detail here. I mean, basically, people thought it, it was OK. Um, you know, it was easy to use, and it was so on and so forth. But I, it's not really uh, all that interesting. Um, so what we concluded from the SBIR phase one study then was that we have uh, this, uh, this neural network mathematical model that's user-friendly, it sits on an iPad, seems to be efficient, seems to replicate what an expert would say, seems to predict at least as well as the full Columbia what happens in the next 72 to, to, uh, hours to a week. And as far as we can tell, um, it perf it's performing better than the ED form of the CSSRS, which we really couldn't find much evidence uh, for, for using. So a few limitations of that. Um, then, I mean, first, this is one healthcare system. We did it at our, at our own institution. Um, limited diversity in the sample. We don't know if this would ha work in, uh, in the middle of Philadelphia um, or Chicago. Uh, short-term follow-up only. We had some significant attrition in the short-term follow-up. So if you did this in a larger healthcare setting and you were able to actually track people uh, sort of really regularly within the healthcare setting, might it be different? We limited it only to adults. So this was 18 plus. I think our oldest participant was 92. 
Um, but uh, we, we did limit it to adults because we are assuming that the model for pediatrics is going to be slightly different than the model uh, for adults. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the less validity in psychiatric inpatient settings, at least in the way that we tested it. So, uh, so what we're looking at then for extensions, obviously an extension to child and adolescence. Uh, we, I showed you that initial uh, table that, uh, where uh, children and adolescents are, um, are really common. It's a really common cause of, of uh, mortality, morbidity in the child and adolescent population. And as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, um, this was sort of what got me intrigued by this project in the first place. So uh, that would be a logical extension. Some extension to inpatient psychiatry and substance use disorders. Um, so we uh, just thank you, Steve. This is in your uh, special edition. It's coming coming out. Uh, Sanchez wrote a nice commentary on uh, opioid use disorder and and suicide risk. Um, so we uh, did get a small grant to to conduct a similar panel within uh, a substance use population to see if the model would change at all. And we're we're working on that right now. Integration into the electronic medical record is an, an important part of uh, what we need to do next. As you all, any of you who are working here are painfully aware of the uh, migration into an electronic health record. I see at least one super user in the audience. Um, so, uh, so we know that it's, uh, it's incredibly important uh, to, to be able to integrate that. Um, and then implementation into a full healthcare sitting in regular practice. So uh, because of the Joint Commission mandate, a lot of hospitals and systems have put into place this sort of systematic screening. Um, but our, my concern, at least, I can't speak for my colleagues, but my concern is that the screening oftentimes takes the play, it take, you know, makes use of uh, the Columbia ED screener, and I'm just not sure in the end that it's going to be all that, uh, all that effective. So we're right now um, uh, proposing a phase two. So the idea here is to, uh, to integrate into an EMR. Um, to uh, try to, to uh, couple with some telepsychiatric or in-person assessment uh, following the screen that we do uh, to try to meet that, uh, that mandate. And hopefully, uh, the, the, you know, the holy grail here is to actually reduce suicide within a region. Um, that, that's what we're looking to do. And, and I know, Tom, I know that's what, what you're interested in doing, um, is trying to reduce, uh, um, reduce suicide in, in states or healthcare systems or, um, or entire regions and then hopefully in the country. A couple other uh, extensions I'll just mention. Uh, so one is uh, with our uh, technology partner, um, uh, VOI. Uh, they are uh, trying to uh, basically do an extension into, uh, into people's homes. So, so basically, they developed this, this product called uh, VOI Reach, which if somebody were to screen positive, they would sign up for this service, which basically allows their healthcare team to be connected and their family members to be connected in order to allow them to check in more regularly on how somebody is doing. And this approach, this approach to connecting people to their community has been something that's uh, worked particularly well in the military. Uh, so the military has found social media to be one of the primary uh, connections that people make, one of the primary protective factors is getting, uh, getting those sort of connections made. They held a symposium down at the uh, Pentagon on uh, military and social media, where Facebook, Google, Apple, LinkedIn all came in, and uh, I was there. Um, so uh, it was really interesting. Um, it was, a, it was a, a, just a fantastic uh, sort of symposium where they really they demonstrated, so, so Google, Facebook, uh, and the like, really in terms of the military, uh, have been pushing uh, this, these sort of protective factors. So uh, the, the additional part about that with social media is detection of risk from social media uh, posts and from uh, social media, uh, sort of mining social media data. Um, so uh, some of you probably have seen this work from Chris Danforth at UVM, looking at how Instagram posts predict whether somebody is depressed. Um, so a question uh, could be uh, whether you could do a similar thing uh, with regard to somebody's Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, or whatever. The, the, uh, what, whatever it is that we're using is what the kids aren't using, right? So we all started using Twitter and they moved to Instagram. We'll start using Instagram, they'll move only to Snapchat. Um, it's whatever Snapgram book thing um, that they're going to be using. Um, and can you mine those data to, uh, to start to predict? What was interesting about this study is it was not as much the content as you would think it was. It wasn't necessarily the content that was predicting uh, depression. There were other factors like um, the, uh, the color of the picture, for example, 
um, might, might, predict, might be a, a predictive marker. Um, and then connection with other types of uh, sort of uh, uh, more physiologic measures or other types of in, in the moment sorts of measures. Uh, so uh, connection with, uh, for example, logical momentary assessment. Uh, so could you be, uh, as somebody screens positive, could you be sending them out with something that is uh, monitoring them more regularly in the, in the short period of time after their discharge, for example. This was a study that showed this in adolescent teens. They had a nice uh, sort of uptake for uh, acceptability for doing some uh, momentary assessment as the teens left an inpatient unit. It was a relatively small study. And this is the, uh, the brief death implicit association test. This is work by Matthew Nock at Harvard, uh, basically uh, taking the implicit associations that we all have uh, with regard to certain things that we don't, we don't think we have uh, a, an association about. So like, you know, our, our, all of our biases are, are, uh, um, are basically coming out in ways that we don't know, and they take advantage of that uh, to determine whether or not somebody has more uh, uh, predisposition towards uh, suicide. So, for example, they have people answer the questions. Uh, they have to push a left button if, if uh, to every time uh, they say something is like them or not like them. So death and life or me or not me. Um, and a question, an item will come up, and they have to sort of go back and forth. And depending on how you code that, whether you're pairing the, the death-related events to me or the death-related events to not me and your reaction time in the way that you're responding to that, you can get a predictive, you can get some prediction, not in the individual in their work, but in the general population of folks who are more likely to die by suicide than folks who, who aren't. So could we do something like that um, as in, in a go-forward way? So I could imagine something where uh, we do some type of assessment like this in the emergency department, and in folks, for example, in the moderate risk category, we could say, uh, well, uh, I, you could probably go home, but could you let us monitor your Instagram uh, data, um, connect you through uh, this social network with your family, friends, and other supports, um, and could, would you do uh, over the next 72 hours uh, some of these brief assessments and that information getting fed to the healthcare team uh, to allow you to basically get some signal for whether somebody's having a harder time in the, in the uh, time uh, following, following discharge. So that's kind of what the, uh, um, what the overall model of this, this sort of approach uh, could eventually be. Um, who knows exactly which of these three things or, or any of them or something else uh, might be in, in the middle, um, but those are the extensions I think that we'll see uh, as we move forward. All right, I think uh, we said I was going to try to leave 10 minutes for questions, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to thank my, my uh, colleagues, and, and I'll thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Not really. Yeah, so the question is, um, you know, we, we went through great, uh, great lengths to show that we could predict what experts uh, predict or what somebody was expressing in the next 72 uh, hours to one week. But how much would you need to do? How, in what kind of system would you need to place this in order to see whether it's going to have an effect? And I think you're looking at, you, you would want to put it in to place in a large healthcare network or ACO that covered a large population and do that over a couple of years. Yep. 
So, so we did. We we went through to look at, uh, for example, whether we would be able to do it within uh, the UVM health network. And if we went to every one of our uh, network hospitals and we ran it over two years, we'd be able to see an effect. If we if we looked at this, we would we would we would be able to see uh, whether whether doing this approach has an effect. But that's that's a large undertaking. Yeah. Um, in the same way, you could do it in a uh, in a statewide way. So you could basically say, let's take a take a state or a half a state, uh, and and do that. And but you'd have to get a lot of buy-in to do that. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, so great question. So the question is, can we, can we make it better? And can we make it better by adding in additional demographics? Yeah, because that, that was the original thought, was if we could integrate it into EHR, we would pull in additional information from the EHR. And basically, if we had it in a system, so we had it in a healthcare system and you're running it out, you would then start to make your model better, right? So this was all still based on that initial model that we built, you know, 2016, 2017, right? We haven't changed the model. But if we collected it in a healthcare system, and then we, we said, okay, now how can we make the prediction better? You could then start to, to build the model, make it much more sort of in real time. The, the, the nice thing about neural network models is the weights can change. And, and so you can basically tune and tweak that model in, in not in real time, because that would, that would be a mess, uh, but you could tune and tweak that model you know, occasionally to make the prediction better and better and better. And I would like to see if those kind of factors uh, make the moderates better, right? So what we're really decent at is lows and highs, but the moderates are the ones, and those are the ones we struggle with in the ER, is what kind of call do I make here? And so could you use these other factors? As you get into a larger population, could you, could you build that model out to really better predict the moderate? Yeah, but a great, great point. I, I took my mean slide out. I almost always show it, um, you know, the, the idea that really in the end um, what we should be doing is reducing lethal means. Yeah, yeah Deb. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, I think uh, what, we're, what we basically said is we're going to start at getting the assessment the best we can get it. Um, and if by only assessing for risk in a better way, could you start to make a difference? Um, but how you tie that into intervention is entirely up to the, up to the rest of the system. And um, so that, you know, our, my last slide about what could we do in the, in the short term afterward you would definitely tie in some other things. Like if you had somebody sitting there at moderate risk, you would hopefully be doing some other safety planning and things like that. And could you, key, could you really concentrate on this period of highest risk and, um, and in doing so basically uh, reduce the rates overall? Because we, we know that in the end the, um, that it's, it's not just your, your accumulated risk factors that, that lead you uh, to the point where you die by suicide it's, or attempt suicide. It's what happens in that moment, um, at any given moment, uh, that ends up uh, sort of uh, pushing things in that direction. And so could we be tracking things in the moment and could we reduce, could we reduce uh, means, I think, are really important uh, components to this that we're not really touching right now, 
because we're still still fighting the fight of trying to get a better risk assessment out there. Other questions, comments? Uh, I, I have one. So, uh, terrific presentation, um, and um, definitely outside of my area of expertise. But when I, whenever I see any of the work that you guys are doing, the funding opportunities to me just seem enormous, and I always have this feeling like you guys should move it faster. <laughs> so the thought that, that I have is that the main team players I know about are physicians who have other responsibilities. This is typical. Um, have you thought much about pursuing these other funding opportunities? Department of Defense, uh, you had mentioned a little bit, but this yeah. is tremendous, but uh, NIH as well. Um, and what crosses my mind is getting clinical psychologists, getting more people whose main responsibility is to push things like this forward through research. Thoughts, comments? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, some, somebody want a job? Uh, I can't pay anything, but uh, uh, no, I, 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 I think you're exactly right. I mean, so we specifically went after SBIR funding because uh, we we wanted to turn it around as fast as we possibly could, and that's the nice thing about SBIRs is, is the, the funding line is is uh, is better. Uh, the turnaround in terms of your grant review is faster, um, and the timeline on doing the grant has to be short, and that's what we wanted to do. Um, so so we did it that way. Um, but there are lots of other opportunities. The DoD piece and the Veterans Administration piece, we are working on that uh, a bit with. Bill Hudanko, who's a clinical psychologist and has a bit more in this in this direction. So we we do have other partners uh, that are doing uh, a bit of that work. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we we can only do uh, so much. I mean, Isabel is is pretty much free most of the time, but uh, <laughs> the rest of us are pretty busy. So. Uh.
sense to me. And um, maybe this is the start of an opportunity for more collaboration with the BCBH to try and help help whatever we can. So uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, is that what you were looking for? Yeah, that was awesome. Good. That was really awesome. A lot of work in this. I did a little bit. But to, but to walk that fine line between my own Sarah's and my, whether I'm talking about Sarah's. <coughs> just thought I'd own it well, at the beginning. Awesome. Literally. I got to run. All right. Pass, but talk to you soon, buddy. Right. Thanks. Have a great time. Bye.